Your department is smashed. Everyone is always in a hurry. You are pretty sure a lot of your employees are working overtime off the books, and you're doing the same thing, so you don't ask questions. No problem. It will be fine as soon as this project is done. A week out from your deadline, the regional manager calls you into her office to request the next project for your team to begin immediately. It's about as large and complicated as your current project. At this time, you essentially have two choices. You say, yes ma'am, and take on the additional project. That is your job and your duty and fulfills not only your individual purpose, but the organization's purpose and, you hope, also matches your team's sense of purpose. This also means that your entire team will stay task saturated and likely be working more than their family lives or sanity will allow for several months longer. You can also say, no ma'am, but you word it well because you've watched my video about leading up, link above. Your team returns to their routine tasks after this project concludes, and they get a few months to breathe and recover. However, this only means that another department gets the task and now they're swamped. This also risks making you and your team look bad to your superiors. So what do you do? What do you think a high-level executive at an international business would do? Perhaps you both feel a bit conflicted about it, but I bet you likely answered no and expect the executive to say yes. You have a sense of morality about doing right by the people around you. My example here is deliberately ambiguous. There are good and selfish reasons to pick either choice. But there's some commonality in humanity's moral expectations from leadership, but different groups of people seem to feel this moral compulsion to do the right thing to varying degrees. Why is this? It's biology. In Simon Sinek's Leaders Eat Last, he explains that four primary reward chemicals, chemicals that make you feel good in different ways, drive human behavior, particularly for leadership. They are endorphins, which masks exhaustion and pain as physical pleasure. This is the reason you feel good after exercise, the so-called runner's high. Dopamine. Happiness from completing a task or being productive. This is the reason you make a checklist and cross off items as they are accomplished. Giving and receiving likes on social media also gives dopamine hits. This is addictive and becomes dangerous if it isn't balanced against other happiness chemicals. Serotonin. Feelings of status or pride. This is why you feel good when you graduate and why a parent feels good about their child's graduation by proxy. Other swells of status also apply. If people regularly show you deference or treat you like you're important and it comes across as authentic, you get a strong serotonin surge. This is often faked by buying more expensive clothes or a car or a bigger house than you can afford. But this serotonin stream is weaker because your brain knows it's fake. Oxytocin, feelings of love, friendship, or deep trust. When your lover strokes your hair while you cuddle after a long week, feeling like your true self around a campfire with your best friends, or when an admired authority figure presents a high priority task to you and says, I trust you. You also feel a surge in oxytocin when you do generous things for others, and to a lesser extent when you see other people do generous things. And this makes people treat you with more status which turns additional serotonin into a catalyst to pursue more oxytocin-producing behaviors to achieve both hits. Cortisol, stress, anxiety. This is phase one of the fight-or-flight response. This is when you feel unsafe, and it shuts off things like oxytocin, making you less empathetic or generous. There are other chemicals that influence human behavior, but Simon is primarily concerned with these, and through the lens of leadership, although someone without leadership aspirations can still use these chemicals to fuel a better life. Let's explore some practical examples of the impact these chemicals have. At one point in time, congressmen spent the majority of their time in DC. While away from their constituents, this meant they spent their full-time effort on representing the needs of their people as they see it. 
to accommodate this, there were community meals, intramural sports, combined church services, and the children of elected officials attended the same schools. This meant that not only were the children friends and the politicians of conflicting ideologies empathetic toward each other by proxy, they were also more likely to actually build some form of friendship or camaraderie between them. As a result, gridlock was not as often a problem in the past. Even from 1955 to 1983, as an almost 30-year minority party, the Republican Party of the United States was able to get some wins for their constituents because the Republicans and Democrats more often saw each other as comrades rather than as enemies. Maybe rivals would be more appropriate. That changed when it was instead advised in the 70s that congressmen spend the majority of their time on advertising, meaning going back home to their districts, and around the same time data came out that smear campaigns were more effective than a polite issues-focused campaign. Unfortunately, these recommendations both proved accurate and, along with other factors, have led to the incredibly divided government that the United States now has. While gridlock has some utility, stability for example, it also means that nothing gets done when it needs to either. Government shutdowns due to budget disagreements are increasingly common, and even some elected officials like Tulsi Gabbard have said that the two parties are expressly segregated with their leadership telling them their entire goal is to ensure the other party gets no wins. It's not that our elected officials are evil, but that the familiarity and trust is not there. They are constantly in a self-replicating cycle of producing cortisol with no oxytocin in the room when they see each other. Alcoholics Anonymous Many of us are familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous, and therefore most of us have heard Step 1, admit that you have a problem. While Step 1 as well as Steps 2 through 11 are no doubt important to overcoming the dopamine-driven addiction to alcohol, it is also true that Step 12, much less well-known, is the most important. Step 12 is to find and help another alcoholic. The reason this works is now that you have overcome the dopamine addiction, you must now replace that void in your neurochemistry, in this case by replacing a shallow source of dopamine with a robust source of oxytocin, which may also encourage serotonin when you become a peer leader to a few others and swell with pride as they overcome their addictions. The military. The military is weird. If you ask most sane people if they'd like to live in a hot desert or freezing mountains, sleeping on a foam pad in a lean-to tent, getting shot at, in close proximity to explosives while hiking 20 miles a day, most of them would give a resounding no. Did I also mention how thin the toilet paper is? But, for some reason, if you ask the same question to a soldier who's already deployed and experienced this lifestyle, he'll probably also tell you no. He does not want to live that way. But then he'll recount how much he loved his deployment and wants to go outside the wire again. He must be crazy. But the military has psychologists to keep watch over the force, and oddly enough, most of them are not insane. Rather, when troops deploy, no matter where they go, combat or not, they are in a place of elevated stress and anxiety, a state of escalated cortisol. But, oddly enough, with immediate objectives before them that are often a matter of life and death for themselves or others, they pull together because they have to. There is no alternative and that need to trust each other once repeated once, twice, three times for a week, a month, or half a year creates an incredibly deep bond. The soldier is willing to go out and fight again because of what he calls camaraderie, but what a neuropsychologist might instead call oxytocin. What you can do about it. What you can do with this information varies by whether you look at Simon Sinek's conclusions more so as an individual or as a leader. Neither is superior. Leadership is treated like it's superior, but most teams need more strong followership and teamwork than they do leadership. For all of us as individuals, I think we can take the following actions. 1. Strive to be empathetic and kind to others. Easier said than done in some cases, 
But doing something simple like helping your neighbor carry their groceries in or giving the homeless guy down the road an umbrella and a burger can feed you oxytocin, which will then make it easier to be kind to others the next time you see an opportunity, so long as you don't lose momentum. Two, don't pursue shallow status. Don't buy the Rolex and Gucci that you don't need or the BMW and Mini Mansion that you can't afford. These sources of serotonin are fleeting and weak, and your brain knows that they are fake. Instead, Assume responsibility to ensure important things are accomplished in and out of the office. This will give you a healthier dopamine source than making sure your crib is hashtag insta-worthy and as your productivity from dopamine grows and you consistently aid others to stay on oxytocin, others will defer to you in respect more often, meaning you mutually receive serotonin. 3. Exercise most all of us can and should exercise more. Do something, anything, that you enjoy that is sustainable for you and gives you some sense of fatigue or burn in your lungs. For leaders, I would phrase my recommended strategy a little bit differently. Design incentive structures on your team to encourage them to work together. Judge people by how much the whole team did based on their contribution not based on the size of their own individual contribution. This is too easy for someone to mask from you. Do not let short-term dopamine-fueled incentives to beat last quarter or the same quarter last year cause you to make short-sighted decisions that induce a cortisol-rich environment that hinders teamwork. Instead, protect your team at all costs while holding them accountable. Your goal is to coach them to success, not replace them. This safety net will create an expressly anti-cortisol environment. With that barrier to oxytocin removed, you may now deliberately commit resources to sincerely optional team building events that should be as informal and small group as possible. We don't want office cringe, we want an actual hangout. This is easier said than done, but Allowing a much more junior member to be an unofficial social coordinator on your behalf will help. Finally, always pass the credit down to your team while assuming the blame. Give sincere, lavish praise whenever possible, both one-on-one -on -one and in groups. Incorporate a 360-degree feedback system into all promotions, bonuses, or other awards like plaques and time off. This will give people a feeling of pride, and when the whole team has a say in who gets higher status, seeing others receive that serotonin will be mutual because they believe in their new manager or their officially recognized top performer. Knowing the big five chemicals in the human brain, what causes them to release and what further behavior they incentivize, gives you a greater ability to deliberately influence yourself and those around you for the better. Simon Sinek's approach in Leaders Eat Last is a very big picture, cloud thinky way to characterize leadership. I personally tend to like more immediately tangible leadership advice, uh, like most of Jocko Willing's books. But the brilliant part about Simon is he doesn't just say a bunch of flowery words to make you feel good so you feel inspired after putting his book down. He explains himself in a more tangible way than most people writing with a very zoomed out approach. In other words, his writing so far, having only read Leaders Eat Last, does a great job of giving a strategic perspective on leadership. As a result, I think I'll read more by him. Uh, I just don't know which book I'll grab next. If you'd like to purchase the book, uh, I'll leave a link down in the description. You only have one life to live. Grow it relentlessly.